Well, how many of you, um, how many of you uh, know something about the book of Revelation? Raise your hand. Yeah, know something about it uh, at all of our campuses. Uh, yeah, and for a lot of us, um, you know, when I, when I grew up, Re Revelation was just, I, all I knew was it was something you should be scared of, right? You need to be worried. Like, I remember coming home and, uh, and nobody being there and being like, the Lord has come and I was not ready and I got left behind. Come on. And, um, and, and, and so uh, I, wanna, I want us to walk through, I, I think a lot of us, uh, sometimes we have, we bring stuff to the text, but I want us to walk through and, um, and hopefully, um, hopefully let the word of God speak for itself. I do think it's going to challenge us and encourage us. And when I think of the book of Revelation, I thought about a meme I saw, and I think we could, I think we could play, put this up at any time, but this became really popular a couple years ago, like in 2020, you know, when it was just all, like all hell was breaking loose. You, you remember, you like, it would seem like every day, every week, it was something new. And um, so this meme became popular. I think we got it. We're going to put it up. There's me looking outside to see what chapter of Revelation we're doing today. Come on. That's funny. That's funny. I don't know if you ever felt like that. You're just like, what, which, what, what are we doing today? We doing the brimstone? We doing the plagues? You know, we doing the pandemic? What's today? And um, so today we're going to kick off. We're going to jump right in. Um, again, we're trying, to, we're trying to walk through and cover really this entire book in just a few weeks. And so um, I hope you're ready to learn. And we're going to jump right into the Word of God today. So we're going to do a lot of teaching. Hope you're ready to take some notes. Revelation chapter 1. Let's start there. Revelation 1. I'm going to read a few verses together, and, and, and uh, we'll read a few more as we go on. Beginning with verse 1. Revelation 1 and 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Skipping to verse nine. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. We'll pause our reading there as we jump into the word of God. Let's pray. Father, right now, give us wisdom. Give us understanding as we come to this book called Revelation. Give us revelation. As we come to your word, God, let it be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, amen. Let's jump right in. John is writing. John's writing this book. Now, um, uh, scholars debate on which John may be writing this book. M many, uh, many scholars believe it was John the Apostle. John, the same author of the Gospel of John. Of course, the Gospel of John, we have three epistles written by John. First John, second John, third John. Um, John in, that, in those three epistle, epistles is referred to as the elder. Some ble people believe that John the apostle is different than John the elder. Is different than John the revelator. We don't know. Um, but most scholars believe this is all the same person. John in, is, in this writing is at the end of his life. He's 90 years old thereabout. Of course, John was the youngest of all of Jesus' disciples. And uh, when Jesus was resurrected, there was a moment when uh, Jesus was talking to John and, and then to Peter and and Jesus says something to John um, that alludes to John's longevity and how long John would live. And Peter started asking him about it. Like Peter got a little bit mad because he was talking about, you know, John and how long John was going to live. John uh, was, of course, the only apostle that ended up not dying by martyrdom. Jesus says to Peter, if I want him to live forever, what's that got to do with you? You follow me. Right. I love that. Jesus is like, that's none of your business anyway. Why are you worrying about how I'm working with somebody else? You worry about what I call you to do. We could learn a lesson from that. 
But many people began to then uh, to assume that John would, there was actually a rumor going around that John would never die, but die because of this thing that Jesus spoke to Peter. John did eventually die, but he lived to be a, an old man. And the context of this book, the Bible says, um, the whole context, we're, we're, we're jumping into this, this book, this book that is full of symbolism, this book that um, uh, is apocalyptic in nature and has to do with end things. It is, uh, it's got uh, allegory and symbols and uh, it's got all kinds of drama. It is hard to understand at times, confusing and sometimes downright weird. And so I think you got to understand the context. Anytime you're trying to understand a text, you have to understand the context of the text and the context for the book of Revelation. First and foremost, the context, John says, uh, he says, I am your brother, but I'm also, um, I, I, I'm, I'm your, uh, your, your, your friend, your, uh, your companion in tribulation. And so this, the context of this book is trouble and adversity and tribulation. Um, and I think that's important. It's important to understand that the Bible really from beginning to end was written by and for people in trouble by and for people in, uh, in cultures and contexts and societies that oppressed them, that, uh, that, that did not celebrate them. Um, that ran counter to the kingdom of God and the word of God and what God had called them to do. And so for us who may feel like we are living in that kind of context and culture, the good news is we have this entire book that was written by people in very similar situations and for us in moments like these. In fact, the physical context of the book of Revelation kind of speaks to this as well. This happens, John says, on an island called Patmos. John is a prisoner there uh, because of the word of God because he is preaching the word of God. They put him on an island called Patmos. Patmos was a remote island in the Aegean Sea, about 10 miles long, six miles wide. It was the ancient world's equivalent to Alcatraz uh, because of where it was, its remoteness and the, and the uh, currents of the ocean there in the Aegean Sea. You could not swim from this island to any of the neighboring islands. And so there was a penal colony based there for prisoners. John is forced uh, into, uh, into forced manual labor at 90 years old on the island of Patmos. In fact, the word Patmos literally means my killing. My killing, we're talking about context. So the revelation of Jesus comes to us through John when he was on the island called My Killing. I, I love that because it was on Patmos. I love it. It's on Patmos that, that John finds God's presence and it's on Patmos that John finds his purpose. Can I just tell you before we get into the book, the context tells us that even when you find yourself in difficult places, especially when you find yourself in places that you feel like this thing is gonna take me out, out, that God will meet you there, show up, and he'll actually further your purpose in moments like that. John did a lot of great things, but one of, like the exclamation to John's life got, he put the exclamation on it in the place where the enemy had put him to shut him up. Come on, even when the enemy thinks he has you where he wants you, God always has you where he can use you. Patmos was one of a number of islands, a group of islands that collectively were called sporades. In the Greek, that means scattered or it means seeds. Come on, because even when it, it seems like you have been scattered by trouble or suffering, the truth is you've been planted on purpose and God has a plan for you. And so John is on Patmos and he's already, he's there because he's, he's already been oppressed and suffering. He's suffering there. He's in manual labor. He is supposed to now spend the rest of his uh, life, the last years of his life suffering there. He actually won't die there. Uh, he's going to write the book there. He'll actually uh, end up getting off of Patmos and uh, tradition says that he spent the rest of his life in a city called Ephesus and finally died there. But on Patmos, John gets this revelation. And as we move from the context of the book to the uh, text of the book, uh, I want to highlight one verse for you that offers, I think, the, 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 the best outline that I know of for the book of Revelation as we start to look at this in, this, in some sections, and we're going to cover it over the course of the next few weeks in these sections. Here it is in verse 19. We read it already. Jesus appears to John. He gives him this revelation, and here's what he says, verse 19. Write the things which you have seen. 
in verse 19. So this is everything that's happened up until this point. These are all the things that we read to open up with. Jesus shows up. John falls at his feet like a dead man. Write these things that you have already seen. The things which are currently happening and the things which will take place after this. Here's the outline. The things you have seen, the things that are currently happening, and the things that will take place. And so there are three sections to the book. The first one I'm going to call the unveiling of the Christ. Unveiling the Christ, because this is the first of the things that you have seen. And what John had just seen was that Jesus showed up to him when he saw him. John fell like a dead man at his feet. And then the things which are, these will be verses two and three. So chapter uh, one, Revelation uh, chapter one are the things you have seen. That is Jesus, the glorified Jesus. Chapters two and three are the things which are currently going on. This is the uh, uh, Genesis, uh, Revelations two and three have to do with the church the age of the church and, and the letters that will be written um, by Jesus to his church. And then chapters uh, four through the end of the book are uh, the unveiling of the end. So the unveiling of the Christ, the unveiling of the church and the unveiling of the end. And over the course of the next few weeks, we will be walking through all of these uh, different sections. But it begins with Revelation chapter one. It begins with a revelation and unveiling because the word revelation uh, comes from the Greek word uh, apocalyptos, which means to uncover or unveil. So something that has been covered up, something that's been hidden, something that's been uh, uh, unseen or not understood is now being revealed. Revelation. And the first one, in fact, this is the way the book opens. We think about Revelation and we're wanting to know, right? We're, we're, we're squinting. What, what part of Revelation are we doing today? What crazy thing? We, we, we want to know a lot of times when we think about Revelation, we want to know what's going to happen. When's it going to happen? How's it going to happen? And we'll get to some of those things. But, but first and foremost, the book of Revelation is not a book that answers what, when, or how. It's a book that answers who. The revelation, here it is, chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Before anything else and after everything else, the book of Revelation is, a, is an uncovering, is a revelation, is a highlighting of the person of Jesus Christ, who he is. And when John sees who Jesus really is, John falls on his feet like he's dead. Now you got to get this. John, this isn't John's first rodeo with Jesus. If this is John the apostle, he has walked with Jesus for years. In fact, he was... He was the one whom Jesus loved. At least that's what he called himself. He was the one like at the Last Supper. He's, he's laying his head on Jesus. He's hanging like they are tight. This is, this is Jesus' boy. He, is, he has seen Jesus in so many different contexts and circumstances, but he has never seen him like this. He has never seen the glorified Jesus. And when he gets a glimpse of everything that Jesus really is, John, the, the apostle, John, the beloved, John, the best friend of Jesus, when John sees Jesus for who he really is, John can can't handle it. He falls on his face like he's dead. It's a whole different revelation of who Jesus is. And he says, once he has seen that, he says, now write what you have seen. And this is what John begins to write. And this is where we'll actually take the portion the, 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 of our text today and, and, and of our study today, Revelation chapter one, verses four through seven, as John does what Jesus says, and he writes what he has seen. This is what John writes Revelation 1 and 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who, now, now remember, he says, write what you have seen and more specifically, write whom you have seen. Write what you just saw and it made you fall on the ground. So here's John. I'm, I'm writing to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace to you and peace. And he's about to write about who he just saw from him who, who is and who was and is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. 
Write concerning the things you have seen. Write about what you just saw. And then I want you to write about everything that's going on right now. And then I want you to write about everything that's going to happen. And that's going to be our outline for this series. But he starts by saying, write about the Jesus that you've just seen. Re- the revelation of Jesus. And so I want to give you six things right here that John begins to write concerning the glorified Jesus. He begins by saying grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. If you're writing down notes, here's the first thing here in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the timeless one. The one who is and was and is to come. The timeless one. Now, I hope it's all right because all day today we're going to be talking about Jesus. Uh, all I got for you is Jesus. And when, and we've, and when you've got a whole lot of Jesus, I'm going to give you a little bit more Jesus. Because again, this is, this is, we'll get to all of the stuff. We'll get to all the prophecy. We'll get to all the end times. But John, John said, Jesus said, your first assignment is tell them about me. Because at the end of the book, it all ends with him as well. At the end of the book, we're all gathered around the throne of the Lamb, singing praises to the one who has loved us and given himself for us, the timeless one, the God of the present, past, and future. How many are glad to know that God is the God of your present, past, and future? That he's the God who redeems your past. He's the God who restores you in your present. He's the one who redirects your future. He is the God in every, in every season and every time. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is God's timelessness. Of course, when God creates, he not only creates uh, matter, he doesn't just create the world, the cosmos, he creates time. He establishes times and seasons to govern the created world, but God is not subject to the creation. He's not subject to time. He stands out of time, which is how God stands in any moment. He is not only omnipresent, he's everywhere. He is also, also um, uh, omni, not just everywhere, he's every when. So God will speak things in, in the present. He'll speak things in your life about the future. They're your future, but they're not God's future. They're always God's present. That's why, that's why the text actually says, not the God who was and is and is to come. It didn't say that, was, is, is to come. It says is, was, is to come because God is always first and foremost the God of the now, the present God. When, when Jesus showed up in the gospel of John chapter 11, Martha and Mary, Lazarus was dead and, the, and they, they said, Lord, if you had been here in the past, you could have done something and one day in the future at the resurrection, maybe you can do something then. And Jesus said to them, no, 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 I am the resurrection and I am the life right now. I am the God of the, who is, was and will be, but first and foremost, he's the God of now. Don't, don't try to relegate the timeless one to your timeline. Don't try to assume that the timeless one can only work according to certain chronological structures of your life. Don't think that because the clock ran out on some, on some clock on your wall or clock in your mind or, or clock in your, in your physical body, well, it's too late for this. It's too late to have kids. It's too late for me to get married. It's too late for God to use me. It's too late for me to do this thing. It may be too late on your clock, but God is not bound to your clock. He is the timeless one. He's the timeless one, which means he is the unchanging one. In an ever-changing world, he is a never-changing God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God, which should give us hope when we're dealing with things. Because the same God who brought us through before will bring us through again. It's why we read the scriptures, to be encouraged. Because the same God who was faithful before will be faithful now. He doesn't change. The Bible says, in him there is no shadow of turning. No shifting. No, he, he's not, he's not shifty. He's not shady. He's not, he's not one way, one day and one way the next. He never has a bad day. He never wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. He never, he never starts a day off and didn't have his coffee. Come on somebody. He's always the same. You can have confidence in him because he is the timeless one. He always is, was, is to come. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same. The verse five goes on to say he is also the faithful witness. If you're writing down notes, he's the faithful one. The faithful one. We're talking about Jesus. He says, John, I want you to write the first thing I want you to write. I want you to write the first chapter, and I want you to make it all about me. I want, I want them to see what you've seen. 
The, the, the revelation that made you drop to your face, the revelation that, that was so much bigger than anything that you knew about me before, I want you to let them know. And John says, hey church, listen, he's timeless. Hey church, listen, he's faithful. The faithful witness. What is it that Jesus is a witness of? What is Jesus witnessing? Well, of course, Jesus is the witness. He is the testifier. He is the commentary. He is the word of God. He communicates the character of God. He shows us what God is like. Jesus becomes the perfect picture of who the Father is. In fact, in one place, in John chapter 14, uh, uh, the disciples are talking to Jesus. This is toward the end of his ministry, and he's been with them for a long time at this point, and, and he's talking about leaving and if I go, I'll come back in these things. And they begin to ask, Philip asks, can you please just show us the father? And Jesus responds and he says, how long have I been with you? And yet you have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you ask, show us the father? He said, if you see me, you see the father. I am uh, the perfect witness. I am the perfect picture. I, I, if you see me, you get the glimpse of everything that God is. And so Jesus is, is, the, is the, the physical manifestation. In fact, Colossians 1 and 15, Paul says, the son is the image of the invisible God, that nobody has seen God at any time, but we have seen the son who is the perfect picture of what the father is like. Therefore, Jesus becomes the final filter for everything as we begin to try to understand what is God and who is God and what is God like. Jesus is the ultimate filter because he's the perfect picture. This is what God is like as we see Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. Because um, a lot of times we're trying to figure out what is God like. We even read the Bible. And here's the thing as you read this, the scriptures. I want to give you this. Uh, what does it mean for Jesus to be the perfect witness? It means that Jesus is the filter through which we read the scriptures. So I read the Bible through Jesus. I don't read Jesus through the Bible. Jesus becomes my faith. As I read the, as I read the scriptures, uh, there are some things that happen in the Bible that, that happen in the Bible. They are biblical, but they are not Christ-like. Some, thing, some things are like stuff happened in the Bible. Is this the character of God? How do we know what the character of God is? Jesus says, here's how you know. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the image of the invisible God. And so in Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the self-giving nature of Jesus, what is God's attitude towards us? Look at the cross and you will see what God thinks concerning you. He is the perfect, he is the faithful witness. He is completely and accurately, he said, I don't even speak of my own, but I only speak the things which I have seen in the presence of my father. I didn't come to do my thing. I come to show you who the father is. And John says he has done it perfectly. He is the faithful one. Verse five goes on to say, he is the firstborn of the dead. Writing down notes, he's the resurrected one. The firstborn of the dead. Death had never had a baby before before 2,000 years ago. But 2,000 years ago, the tomb was transformed to a womb. And on the third day, Jesus came out, the firstborn of the dead. Now it's the firstborn of the dead because he's not the lastborn or the onlyborn of the dead. To that point, he had been the only one who had been dead and then raised himself from the dead. But uh, the Bible teaches us that because Jesus was resurrected, will be resurrected with him. I love the idea of a resurrected Lord because that means that Jesus understands suffering and he even understands death. It means, it means that Jesus isn't just innocuous to pain. He didn't, just, he didn't just roll through the earth and couldn't anything touch him. In fact, the author of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who is untouchable by the pains and the feelings of our infirmities, but in every point was tempted and tried and tested like as we are yet without sin that Jesus understands the human condition because he didn't just come like a man, he came as a man. He wrapped himself in flesh and he embodied the human experience all the way. He became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And so Jesus isn't just the God who never died. He's the God who was dead. In fact, he goes on to say, I'm the one who's alive. I was dead, but now I live and I live forevermore. Jesus is the overcoming one. Jesus is the one who 
who, who looked uh, every adversity in the face, even death itself, every enemy of humanity he took on. He bore every wound and he overcame everyone. He is the resurrected one. And the good news is he understands. He understands the affliction of Friday, our most painful moments. He understands the silence of Saturday where we feel stuck in between and something happened to us and it's not happening anymore, but we're still under the shadow and we're still not healed and things still aren't better. He understands, but he also knows the solace of Sunday that no matter how bad it is and how dark it is, come on, Sunday's coming and weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And the author of the Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies. And so that because Jesus is the resurrected one, all of us who are in Christ will be the resurrected ones, which means death doesn't get the final word, which means pain doesn't have the final word, which means the tears you're crying, they don't get the final word. The fear that you feel does not get the final word because he is the resurrected one. Come on. They, they, he faced it all and he overcame it. And because he overcame it, we overcome it. The resurrected one. Verse five goes on to say, he said, I hope this is all right. Cause all I got for you is Jesus. He said, just tell him all the things you saw about me. He continues, uh, uh, John continues. He's the ruler of the Kings of the earth, the ruler of the Kings of the earth. He's the sovereign one, the sovereign one. I love it. Isaiah 9 and 6, this is the prophecy concerning Jesus' birth, birth. For unto us, we read it at Christmas, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And the government will be upon his shoulders. He is sovereign, the ruler of the kings of the earth, which means that Jesus is not subject to earthly governmental authorities. He's not subject. He, he, he is not uh, at, at the, at the uh, mercy of the powers of this world. He is sovereign above all of the powers of this earth. So whatever power is wielding power over your life, whatever power you feel like has authority over you, is oppressing you, is, is, is uh, ultimately causing you harm and damage. When you look at the world and you, maybe you look at the governments of the world and, and, and you have fear and consternation, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus is the sovereign one. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. In fact, later in Revelation, in chapter 17, Verse 14, it says, and they, the, the, the nations, will wage war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. That the lords of the earth, the kings of the earth, the powers that be, must the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means every president, that means every king, that means every potentate, that means every governor, that means every elected official, that means every CEO, that means every person of power, every person that wields power on this earth, they will bow to the to the one true king and they will recognize the sovereignty of Jesus. That at the end of the day, Jesus has the last word. Jesus is in control. Jesus is sovereign. Jesus stands before Pilate and and he refuses to answer Pilate's questioning him. Pilate, the governor who has the authority in the case of Jesus as the religious leaders bring Jesus to a mock trial, a setup with an attempt to take his life. And and Jesus refuses to make a defense. He refuses to try to exonerate himself. And Pilate says, why won't you speak to me? Don't you understand, John chapter 19, don't you understand that I have the power to free you or to crucify you. But Jesus said, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. He said, the only power you got, I gave you. 
So I don't recognize your power. I recognize the fact that all the power you have, you were given and you were lent for a moment and you won't give it up at some point. But my kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world because if my kingdom was of this world, Jesus said my followers would fight. But you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to exert governmental, uh, earthly authority over me. But the truth is I am still sovereign. Isaiah 66, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. I love that because it means whatever it is on earth that I'm struggling with is under his feet. He's above it. He's sovereign over it. We used to sing a song in church when I grew up. We, we used to say, it's under my feet, or it, 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 it's, uh, it's under his feet, that, that everything that's going on in my life, in the world, every trouble in my life is under the feet of Jesus. Heaven is his throne. The earth and everything in it is his footstool. I, I, I heard this week that the queen uh, passed away. I heard she reigned for 70 years. That's unbelievable. Uh, I, I, I started to read about all the different things that she saw and witnessed as she was the monarch of Britain. As a very young woman, just in her 20s, she became the monarch, the queen of England, and all the various things, good and bad, that happened during her 70-year reign. Nobody has reigned over Britain for longer than Queen Elizabeth II, uh, that she had reigned for 70 years. The queen reigned for 70 years, but can I tell you, there's a king who reigns forever. Can I tell you he's sovereign? Can I tell you he'll never be disposed? He'll never be removed. He'll never be replaced. They'll never vote him out. He is the king over kings and the Lord over lords and his name is Jesus. So why are you worrying? If if Christ is for us, who can be against us? It's Christ in us, the hope of glory because at the end of the day, he is sovereign. It doesn't mean I always understand it. It doesn't mean that I can always manipulate God for my purposes, but it does mean that many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the purpose of God that always is established. He is sovereign. He is king. He is Lord over every circumstance. You look at the world and you say it's unfair. You look at the world and it seems, it seems dark and wicked and evil. We can look around us and say, but God, what about all these things? But here's what you need to know. God is sovereign. He sits on the, on the throne of heaven and the earth is his footstool. And so we join with the apostle in 1 Timothy as he says, now to the king, immortal, invisible, eternal, the only wise God, to him be power and glory and honor forever and ever because he's sovereign. Verse five continues. He said, John, tell him about me. First, I want you to tell him what you've seen. I want you to tell him all that I am. He's not just the sovereign one. He goes on in verse five and says, to him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. If you're writing down notes, he's the saving one. Number five, he's the saving one. Come on, the sovereign one is also the saving one. The the turn here for us that are familiar with the character of Christ, the characteristics of Christ, this might not take us by surprise, but you've got to get this. We're talking about the Lord of glory. We're talking about the king over all the kings and the Lord over all the lords and the sovereign God of heaven. And the Bible says that the sovereign one is the saving one, uh, that the Lord uh, loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood, that he, he's not just a powerful God, he's a personal God. Come on, this is good. It's one thing to acknowledge the power of God, that God is the creator and God puts all these things into motion and he's sovereign all of, over all of creation. But it's another thing to say that the God of the universe, that the God who created all things also is deeply committed to his people through a loving covenant that God, the Lord, is also the lover of my soul, that he, he's not just powerful, he's personal. He doesn't just lord over us, he loves us. In fact, the book of Revelation it gets a bad rap. It's weird. It's, it's apocalyptic. There's all this craziness and war and, and symbolism and all of this stuff. But the end of the day, the book of Revelation is a love story over and over. You see a story where God wants to be with his people. In fact, at the end of the book, tell them what it's going to tell them, tell them what you've seen, tell them what's going on right now and tell them what's going to happen. And at the end of the book, the, the final kind of vision of what's going to happen 
Revelation 21, 3, I heard a loud shout from the throne because he's sovereign. Saying, look, God's home is now among his people and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with him. The whole book of Revelation is God's desire to be with us. It's not just the heavens up there and earth down here. In fact, the Bible says there's a new heaven and a new earth and and heaven comes down and the new Jerusalem descends and now heaven and earth, there's no, there's no barrier, there's no gap where heaven starts and where earth begins and where earth ends and heaven. And God is with his people because this is a love story. He loved us and freed us from our sins by his blood, by his Blood, by that royal, regal blood. We used to sing, growing up we used to sing a song that said, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, Jesus died upon that cross. I know it was the blood for me. With his blood, the king of glory, the creator of all things, the sovereign God humbled himself to live life on earth, to enter human existence, to save us from ourselves and from all of the powers that would hold us in bondage and oppression. He came down. He became not just like us. He became one of us. And one drop would have been enough. One drop can make the vilest sinner clean. One drop from the royal veins of the sovereign one, the holy one. You say, you don't know what I've done. I'm telling you. The Bible, the, 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 the Bible says that, that just that even the worst sins and the worst sinners, that the same thing that is required to save the best of us is required to save the worst of us. By his blood, he saved us. He freed us from our sin. And it goes on to say, and he made us by his blood. He he freed us from our sins. And he made us kings and priests to his God and Father. He freed us from our sins. And then he made us kings and priests. One version says he made us priests to serve. Because you weren't just saved from something. You were saved for something. Come on, he's the saving one. But he didn't just save you from stuff. He saved you for stuff. He saved you to make you kings and priests. He saved you for a purpose. The saving one, the sovereign one, became the saving one. And then John finishes this section. Verses 4 and 5 and 6. And he finishes with verse seven. Show them who I am, John. Tell them what you have seen. Oh, I've gotten a glimpse of Jesus like I've never seen him before. I've seen the timeless one. I've seen the resurrected one. I've seen the sovereign one, the saving one. I've seen, I've seen all these facets of Jesus. And in verse seven, he leaves us with this. He says, behold, he is coming with the clouds. John finishes this section, this description of Jesus. In his final description, he says, and all these things, he's the sovereign one who is the saving one. He's the all-powerful one. He's the Lord who's also the lover who comes in and pours his life out for the sake of his people. That by his own blood, we could be freed from our sins. He says, and one more thing, he's the returning one. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's the returning one. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. John had written before, John 14 and 3, the gospel of John. Jesus says, he says, don't be worried. Don't be overcome with fear. Don't be anxious. Because 
in my father's house, there are many rooms. And if I go away, I will come again, John 14 and three, and take you to myself. Again, this is a, this is a love letter. I got to go away, but I'm going to come back and I'll bring you to myself so that you may be where I am also. He's the returning one. Jesus ascends to heaven. He says, though, I'm coming back. In fact, four times in the book of Revelation, there's this phrase, I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. And sometimes when we think about the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, right, is shrouded in all of this fear. And instead, it ought to be not covered in fear, but unveiled to see the beauty of the one who loved us and gave his life for us. Now he's coming back for us so that where he is, we may be also. He said, I got to go away. It's good for you that I leave because if I go, I'm going to send you another comfort. I'm going to send the spirit. But listen, I still want to be with you. And one day I'm coming back for you. So what do we do? Matthew 24 and 44. Therefore, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming. When? When's he coming? We're going to study the book of Revelation. When is he coming? At an hour you do not expect. You don't know when he's coming. You must always be ready. What should we do if he's the returning one? He said, I'm coming. Four times in the book of Revelation. Hey, tell my people I'm coming soon. You must always be ready. So how do we get ready? Let me give you this and we're going to pray. First John 2 and 28. And now, remember, this is written by the same guy. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. That we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be ashamed if we do what? If we abide in him. Our confidence is not, again, our confidence is not in what we have done. Our confidence is in what he has done for us. And if we abide in him, he said, he said we got to always be ready. Well, how do I be ready? I abide in him. I got to stay connected to him. Abiding means staying, dwelling, long term. This isn't just a prayer that I pray on a Sunday. It's not just a prayer that I prayed when I was a kid. That this is if you want to be ready. If you want to be ready. You look around the world and be like, man, what's going on right now? He says, behold, I'm coming soon. So be ready. In fact, he said, he's going to come back. He writes, John writes in verse seven, he's coming back and, and, and everyone will look at him and those who have pierced him will mourn. Not everybody's going to be ready. So how am I going to be ready that I have a relationship with him that abides? Does it mean I'm perfect? No, but it means I'm staying in this relationship with Jesus. And today, as we finish in the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about not just what John had seen, the resurrected, the glorified Jesus, but the things that are right now and the things that are going to happen and are coming to pass in the future. But here's what you need to know more than anything else. That the sovereign God is the saving God. He's the one who loved you. And while you were at your worst, the one who created you came for you on a rescue mission and it cost him everything and he gave his own life and he's coming back and the way you're ready for that is that you stay in a relationship with him so at all of our locations today our heads are bowed our eyes are closed and I just want to take a minute and I want us just to recognize the revelation of Jesus Christ the unveiling of who Jesus is God, that we would get a glimpse of who you really are. 
Because we can be around you and we can talk about you. And John has spent his life teaching people about Jesus. But still he only knew in part. But when he saw you that day, he fell on his face. Because he knew you are so much more than I can imagine. Right? Tell him, John. Yeah, tell him that I'm sovereign. Tell him that I'm timeless. Tell him that I'm glorious. But tell them that I love them. Tell them that I shed my own blood so that they could be free from their sins. Tell them I'm coming again. And they can be ready if they abide in me. If you're here today and you aren't right now in a real relationship with Jesus, you're not ready for the return of Christ. If you've never had a relationship with God, or maybe you, maybe you used to, but you've walked away, things have happened, life has happened, Jesus said, abide in me. So whether for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time, I want to invite you into a relationship with the sovereign Lord, who is also the one who saved you, gave himself for you, has broken every curse over you, has broken every chain connected to you. If you're here today, you're ready to get right with God. Come on, pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it out loud. God, thank you. Sovereign God, saving God. Powerful God, personal God. Thank you for loving me. Little old me. Just me. Out of billions and billions and billions and billions of people who have walked planet Earth. And yet you loved me. You love me so much that you gave your one and only son. Jesus, you gave your life with your own blood. You purchased my freedom. Today, I receive. Today, I say yes. Today, I abide in you. Today, I want a relationship with you. Not based on what I've done, but based on what you've done for me. I receive salvation. I receive forgiveness. I receive every good thing, every blessing of God that you give through Jesus. Today I receive it. And in the moment that I do, I know that I'm right with you. In the moment that I do, I know I'm ready for your return. God, now help me to abide in you. Those of us who are Christians and who are walking with you, have a relationship with you, God, help us in this hour. What do we do? You gotta always be ready. Well, how am I always ready? I'm gonna abide in him. So God, help us to lean in closer. Help us to, to, to lean in to a relationship with you. God, in this season more than ever before, help us, God, not to drift away, but to lean in and to abide in this relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.